helping everything. So the dividend yield has held at a fairly strong level. That means Malaysian companies are paying strong dividends compared to the current share price. And it's held at about this level for some time already. And uh, that means the current levels of dividend yield is sustainable into the future. It is not overvalued from a dividend yield perspective. Um, I will go take you through some, some of the economic picture very quickly. This is just for interest sake. And that explains why I am not terribly optimistic about the uh, possibility of this stock market continuing to climb months after months in the um, year ahead. The picture for growth globally is that Malaysia's growth in the context of global growth has been fairly strong. Our recovery, for, sorry, for some of you who are seated very far back, this is not clear at all. Um, we do our own computation of uh, Malaysia's GDP growth. The official numbers from Bank Negara and from the Statistics Department is that at the third quarter, at the point of the third quarter, the contraction was minus 1.2%. But in the, in the third quarter, if you look at the, just the quarter-on-quarter quarter changes and seasonalize it out, take out the seasonal element, element, Malaysia's growth has been one of the strongest in the region. Our growth was 18.4% year-on-year. For some of you who follow Singapore's GDP growth, you can see that Singapore's GDP growth, which is reported on a quarter-on-quarter quarter annualized basis, in the third quarter, it was also very strong, about 15% up year-on-year. But in the fourth quarter, you can see what's happened to Singapore's growth. It's fallen back to minus 6.8%, quarter-on-quarter seasonally adjusted annualized rate. So Singapore's GDP growth was the first to be reported anywhere around the world, that, but it provides you a, little, a very quick glimpse into what's up ahead. After reporting very strong growth, Singapore reported as high as uh, 21, 22% growth in the um, second quarter of uh, 2009, but by the fourth quarter, it had slipped back into contraction. So by analogy, I think the same thing is going to happen everywhere around the world. Um, growth is going to slip back into negative growth, uh, in the negative territory. Malaysia's growth, very strong in the third quarter. In the fourth quarter, I think unlike Singapore, we continue to grow. Uh, Malaysia's growth continued, but it will be a much smaller number than plus 18% that we saw in the third quarter. Everywhere around the world, on a on the quarter on quarter basis, all countries, with the exception of UK, has returned to positive growth. The UK is a laggard. UK's growth remained minus 1.2 percent quarter on quarter annualized. Okay, um, I hope UK doesn't go back to being the sick man of Europe. Uh, that term has not applied for a long time. But Singapore, interestingly. Uh, which has reported strong growth, had slipped back into negative growth. On a year-on-year -year basis, you can see most countries in Asia are still in negative territory, with the exception of Korea. Korea in the third quarter had already gone back into positive 0.6% year-on-year growth. Okay. What does it look like for the world as a whole in 2010? The IMF expects world growth to return to plus 3.1%. Uh, emerging economies especially strong, plus 5.1%. Um, the World Bank expects something similar, but they are a little bit more conservative. They expect 4.4% growth this year. Uh, and then, and, but unfortunately, if you took out China and India, world growth X. China and India is just about plus 2.5%. So not so strong if you exclude China and India, which are the star performers globally. Imagine this is economy runs on one, two, three, four engines, let's say. This is a four engine um, economy. 
we can see growth in only two sectors. There is growth in private consumption, but barely positive levels. And then there's very strong growth in public sector spending. Everything else, no, there's no growth. So we have some consumer spending growth and a very strong government spending growth, but nothing else. Business spending is in contraction. Uh, on the export side, not too great either. Okay. So net exports contracted, uh, business investments, very weak levels, um, business investments in the fixed assets, contracting business investments into inventory, barely growing, only public sector spending and uh, uh, public sector consumption spending and uh, private sector consumption spending. Only these two are keeping the economy growing. Oh, the big question mark is what happens when the, there's a withdrawal, when the government stops spending. Okay. So the same picture is being repeated on a sector basis. There is out of the five sectors in the economy, in the third quarter, agriculture was contracting, mining was contracting, manufacturing was contracting, only construction and services were up. And these two were up because of government spending. Obviously, government services are part of this services figure here. And construction is, has gone up a uh, strong 7.85%, mainly because of government spending. Can this government spending continue? Uh, is it effective? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Um, Taking the U.S. as an example, the answer is probably not. It can help to reduce some of the pain, but it cannot take away the pain completely. Why? You can, you can see the reduction in the pain has come mainly because of uh, strengthening of bank balance sheets worldwide. But let's look at this, the losses at banks worldwide. 1.7 trillion in losses at financial institutions worldwide. That's a mind-boggling sum of money. 1.1 billion in the U a trillion in the U.S., 574 billion in Europe, and just 43 billion in Asia. What's up ahead next year? The banks are continuing to make losses. Uh, they may report profits, but these profits are not from lending, not from normal lending. They make, they're trading their money, their way up. Um, the case I made earlier on about why banks want to keep stock markets and bond markets and maybe property markets strong worldwide is because of this. They want to restore the banks back to health. And the, how do the banks make money? They make money from trading, they make money from lending. If they make money from trading, whenever the bond market and stock markets are strong, that will help them. So. If the stock markets are strong, the banks will therefore uh, come, go back into some level of health. Okay? Um, so the governments are keeping interest rates low so that the trading opportunities in the bond market uh, continue to exist, to hold up for the banks. They're keeping stock markets strong so that there's also trading profits for the banks. The uh, proprietary trading desk can make money. Uh, but the, on the other side of the balance sheet, the lending activities, that doesn't look great at all. Uh, look at this example, uh, this charts that I've put down here. In the third quarter, up to the third quarter of last year, US NPL ratios, the banking system NPL ratios were continuing to climb. Uh, we don't have the December quarter numbers just yet, but you can expect that it would have gone into double digits. The NPL ratio for the banking system, the US would have gone to double digits which is a, a very serious problem. That means they will continue to suffer losses from the normal banking operations uh, other than trading. And one of the ways in which banks can continue to expand their profits is to lend more. Are they lending more?